This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. All right, I think we're done screwing around. So, Lizzie Rosen, thanks so much. It took me, what, 10, 10 years to get you on the podcast. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, and we live like very close, or we lived very close to each other before you just moved. Um, and so, Lizzie and I worked together at Bright Cove a long time ago. Um, mm-hmm. Right. And so, now tell everybody what you're doing. Sure. Um, so I lead customer success and implementation at Vendor. Uh, our goal is to change the way that people buy and sell SaaS and to create fair playing fields for people people to be able to uh, move from intake to procure on buying different SaaS vendors. Um, and we, we're really talking about how do we fix sales and how do we make that entire process smoother for both buyer and seller. And it's been awesome, but uh, Jeff mentioned that we work together. I, I got my first big girl job working for Jeff, so super excited to be here. Where I was a, a project manager at the time on his ProServe team at Bright Cove. Yes, and did an amazing job, right? We <laughs> thank you. It was funny. I was I, I always use that team as an example. It kind of gets into our chat for today of how you need a good balance on your on your team, right? And um, mm-hmm. obviously we put Adrian on the most technical projects that we had and uh, <laughs> it's gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm still working with Kate. Um, so, uh, but, you know, it was nice like when we had, okay, we've got Kirsten who's maybe a little bit more on the PMP variety and he's gonna like really grind you down on the dates and everything, but then, then there's a more of a relationship person. And then, you know, and then you came mm-hmm. in and probably learned from all of them and everything. So, so yeah. 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 Exactly. It was a great experience. I mean, I just remember not knowing exactly what I wanted to do after doing a sales role and interviewing you, interviewing everyone on your team and knowing that's the path that I wanted to go down. And then lo and behold, both of us end up in CS later. Um, Crazy. What well, we were doing, of, I mean, as I yeah, tell everybody, what we were doing. Yeah, I still feel we were doing mostly CS back in the day too. Like nobody was taking care of those customers, right? We we got these customers that were more advanced instead of just like buying the service and popping their credit cards in. They needed all whole experiences built, and then we kind of maintain those and things like that. So, um, but um, so now vendor, which is great. I have gone through a vendor procurement process uh, with one of my customers, so uh, so I, that I know the service, and that's great. So one thing, and we literally just, I, we just, uh, you popped up on a, on a venture community that, that we're both in and I reached out and we just said, Hey, let's just check. Right. And then, Mm -hmm. then for some bizarre reason, we got into this superheated top, like we're on the same, on the same, (laughs) we weren't opposing. Um, but, uh, we were talking about how technical customer success managers should be, which I, which if I remember the timing in the people I was working with time huge issue um i was working with a company that um actually worked a couple of companies that make developer tools and um and you've Mm -hmm. done you've worked in in the similar thing where where it was like we need all of our our csms to to not just know the value that we're providing but also write python i was like oh okay great okay that that, hmm, let me think about that so i don't want to keep driving this down my agenda so lizzie i'd love to get sort of your perspective on that and just in general, what you're seeing out there and in your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's interesting because like no matter the company, I feel like, well, I shouldn't say no matter the company, a lot of the companies that I've joined when I've interviewed, you know, you ask, so what's going on with the CSM team? And whether you hear it from founder or from someone on the product team um, or even the the CS leader, I always hear what the CSMs need to be more technical. Yeah. I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like how technical, how technical? Um, and when someone is technical, how do we know that they're technical? And the thing that kind of, I think you and I started kind of laughing about, which always seems to happen is you feel like you can never find these people because you need someone who's technical relationship, someone who can project manage something from start to finish and someone who can own, in some cases, the renewal transaction. 
so they can actually negotiate deals too and it becomes this unicorn. Uh, I, I think there's thousands of those people out on LinkedIn, unless you just, you just <laughs> can't, can't open up LinkedIn without finding those people looking for a job. It's hard. It's hard. And then like, I think, yeah, you do find one of them. Yeah. And then everyone says, oh, just hire more people like that. It's yeah. like that person was so hard to find. So I think like, you know, you posted about this on LinkedIn. We got tons of comments, a <laughs> bunch of people who had opinions about this, but I think it was all really similar that you want someone to be able to be technical enough to be able to speak to the, the persona that they're selling into. Yeah. And then you also want them to be curious, curious enough to want to learn the things that they don't know. Like whenever I'm hiring, I'm always looking for people to be self-aware because we don't know all, we don't, we can't all know everything, right. but we can know what we don't know. And then you just have to be curious enough to go figure it out. Right. Or to yeah. go ask the people who do have those answers. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, like a tricky balance of, do you want full on technical, but then you're potentially sacrificing the commercial savviness? Yes. Or do you want somebody who's commercially savvy and maybe they're lacking the technical, but then you think, okay, aptitude and intelligence wise, I could probably train this person, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and you did a great job of describing what I usually just do with my hands, which is like, they just outweigh each other, right? You can never find, you know, the more technical you get, you know, those that person writing the Python is not taking your customers out to steak dinners essentially, right? Yeah. Well, and I think too, it becomes really easy to get caught in the weeds, right? Like, I think it's really easy as a CSM, especially if you're a technical CSM or you know the product in and out to feel busy all day answering questions. I'm busy. So I'm accomplishing something when actually some of those things probably should have gone to tech support. 100%. Some of those probably should have been product features. And then you're spending less time on the technical or the strategic work and more time on the technical work, which actually might not be driving the ball forward. So even if you are technical, how do you hold yourself accountable towards driving strategic direction forward right. and not just answering questions? They're just right? a little bit technical. And, and so I had this, oh God, you just triggered off some. Um, I had this CSM <laughs> that was, would spend hours looking through JSON. And, in, and if they had sent it to one support person, it would have been answered in like 10 minutes, right? Yep. And then next thing you know, all the requests are piling up. And, and then this person, I'm starting to get emails at like 1.30 in the morning to a call. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I had to catch up on my stuff and everything. I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and especially with, with technical stuff, when it gets into the real nitty gritty, if you're not doing that on an everyday basis, like you slow down, you got to look up everything. So there's a fine balance. Um, you know, I mentioned before, when you're working on a very technical product, I can get it a little bit more, but there's still levels, right? Like if you mm -hmm. sold, I still feel like if you sold like a million dollar contract, you know, something like this just massive amount of money or anything, I would want more of a relationship person on that account. And then paired with a CS engineer, solution architect or something like that. I mean, but they still need to know the difference between like, source control and um, <laughs> like video, right? <laughs> Go back to our background. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think it becomes different too. And we had this when I worked at Pluralsight when you have multi-product. Yes. Is having like the CSM be the account owner, but then having specialists per product. Um, because if the products are really different from each other too, then it, it can become nearly impossible to find someone who could be an expert in each. And so that's when you have the CS engineer that you're pulling in to become the product expert to any given audience based on what the need is, right? And which specific product you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, so what do you, what is your usual, you know, fire back to the, to the hiring managers and things like this when you hear that? <laughs> well, typically the question is, yeah, how will you like, how, how technical is too technical or what is technical enough yeah. and trying to really understand that. And then really poking and prodding, like, well, do you expect them to be able to code? Do you expect them to do troubleshooting? Right? Like some of this is just discovery versus yeah. troubleshooting. Right. I think those are different. And it still sounds like support. Everything you just said to me similar. sounds like support. Everything you just said to me sounds like support. I don't think discovery though. Discovery is if someone's asking you, someone has a problem, you're asking like why that problem is a problem or what impact that has to them or what, right? I think that's different than saying like, well, did you try this? Did you turn it on? Did you turn it off? Right? Which is yeah. usually what IT tells me, right? And it always fixes everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
right? Like, so I think that's kind of the difference is like, can I have like a, a technical or strategic mindset to be able to ask why the question is an important one instead of just answering the question from a support troubleshooting lens? Yeah, it's, I'm not all the way there with you. I, I, okay. I yeah, I, I, I just, again, we can't cover like all co companies and their sizes and things like that. I, I just feel I'm thinking in large company mindset, but if I, if I, if I bring it back a little bit, I, I can see a little bit more of what you're saying. Like if you're in the A, B round or something like that, um, which then triggers off the other thing to me, which is at that stage, the founders are just so relentless about this. And I just want to just, yeah, you know, yell and scream. <laughs> They're usually, if it's a technical product in a technical founder, Yes. They don't green light these hires and you wind up with people, you know, you've got people that are hired or whatever and they're, you know, you, their case, whatever, their, their number of customers are just blowing up. They're, I don't know, it's just never a good solution. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard. I think especially to, to be like in that early stage, it's like, I'm actually interviewing for grit and resilience, right? Yeah. Um, it's like, it's the curiosity, the self-awareness, but also like, we're going to pivot on a dive and are you going to be prepared for that? Are you going to be able to handle it? Or are you going to get whiplash? Yeah. Which I know is now getting away from technical, but it's like overall acumen. I think you need to, or skill set to be a successful customer success manager in an early stage company. Yeah. Yeah. The, the resilience is a big thing. Um, and then you're, and then imagine just adding in the, you know, as I said, something like, a technical product like APIs or source control or this and that. I just find I, it's hard for me to see like your classic school teacher that has transitioned into a CSM and then suddenly they're on these types of products. I, I just don't see that either. I'm just trying to figure out what the middle ground is because you do want them to be able to say, you bought for these outcomes. These are the outcomes mm -hmm. that you're getting. Are you getting those outcomes and be able to speak in that language? Um, but then if it goes the next level down, they're not going to be able to talk to a lot of things. And then how do we support yeah. those people at that level? And that's where I usually have solution architect, engineer, or something like that. Did you, did you do that at Pluralsight? Yeah. So we did start having, um, we had CSMs per product. So we had acquired a company that had a more technical product. And so then we had CSMs that were specifically um, focused on that product. So that was like an overlay model. Um, which I think worked pretty well, especially given that it was a very technical audience, very technical product. Yeah. Um, but then I've worked at single product companies where it's a very technical product. And we really struggled with that is like how to find people who can do both the commercial savvy and the tech savvy. Um, and we found a few of them. <laughs> we did, but it was definitely, you know, for, for, you know, one hired would one type of person would really have to upskill on the commercial side, and one type of person would really have to upskill on the technical side. So, how can you find diverse teams that can be able to like train each other, or yeah. just decide we're going to have two completely separate separate roles and they work in tandem? Aren't this is it the soft skills that are harder to train? Like, isn't it harder to train a more technical person how to be more commercial savvy than it is to get a commercial savvy? I don't know. The, that's that's a tough one. What, I mean, I think experience? so. I think soft skills are harder. Yeah. I yeah. think if you have the gift of gab, like if you can't really like teach someone to have the gift of gab, right? Yeah. 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 I think I, I, I've seen studies. I think it was the soft skills that are a lot harder to teach as well, too. So, yeah, it, it's it's great. We, so we had a question on the LinkedIn post we should probably dive into because when, when we originally were talking about this. I can't remember if I posted it. No, 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 because then I, we we had chatted. I said I should write something yeah. about this, um, and then and then somebody came in with a question or two. So what, what's 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 going yeah. before I forget? Okay, the question. Let me just pull it up. It was around what to do. Oh, of course, now I can't find it. It was about like what to do when you see job postings that look more like engineer job descriptions when they're actually CSM job descriptions. <laughs> so I guess that that question is with the for the for the person looking for a job, if they see something that looks more technical, I, I would say just 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 walk away and not go for it unless you're technical, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I think like it just goes into bias in overall job descriptions, right? Like you see 
uh, a job description is like looking for hunters only rock stars like you know if you're not an a plus player don't apply which are like very biased towards you know one gender over the other right whereas on it's almost like on the very engineering side of like a cs role it could be biased towards one or the other too and i think in this job market people are starting to put these crazy job descriptions together because there is so much talent out there yeah. that they're trying to find the best of the best but then at the same time you're sometimes creating roles that are unattainable but i mean if you are interviewing at one of those i would ask the questions that i said before like what do you mean by this like how technical do you expect it if a customer comes to me with this type of problem what's your expectation of the csms um what's your ramp period how do you help csms skill up on your products like i would probably ask those and i would i would ask to speak to a csm up here i would want to talk yes. to somebody who's in the role to understand what their experience <laughs> is if they feel like they understand the product and if they feel like the job description is accurate to the work that they're doing i remember doing that one time and it took them like two weeks to get back to me they're like okay we're going to chat with this one you could tell it was coached appropriately and everything too <laughs> Oh my God. I, there's a lot of great stuff that you just said in that comment that um, pulled back the, especially the enablement and the ramp period, right? Um, Cause it's hard enough just learning a product in and out, right? And mm -hmm. you know, this gets into that whole, should CSMs know how to use the product and everything too. And I'm like, well, again, you know, if it's an API product that's headless, are you expecting CSMs to be writing API calls? Yeah and getting responses back and things like that versus you know and then who's doing the training is another good question no, like okay what's the implementation look like and i know you run implementation too so you know it, it's again are, are they are they implementing are they are they doing the training during a implementation? are they just working on the use cases so so mm -hmm. much to get into on that one right so you're get ask a lot of questions and i think people are scared to do that because people are looking for jobs yes yes and i think like we're talking about a lot of problems here we haven't really talked about a lot of solutions but i think it's really company specific product specific yeah persona specific of who your buyer is so i, I don't know that there is a one-size-fits-all answer i mean i like cs engineer i like cs architect i like all of those things i like product specialist mm -hmm. um but it, i really think it just depends on the stage you're in and how big yeah. your company is and and I've worked and helped plenty of companies that don't need any of that, right? It is CSM. Mm -hmm. Some don't even need implementation teams, right? Like it's it's that easy, or you just you're you're just helping them. Um, I signed up for this product, uh, Jasper AI, which helps with a lot of like writing and stuff like that. I swear to like the best <laughs> like onboarding and CSM digital outreach that you've ever seen and everything. That's awesome. And it's the CSM that does all the recordings and let me know if you got a question and this and that and everything. Again, that's something you could go in and learn during training and, and everything like that. I, I just, um, I, I really struggle with these like super complex tools and things like that. Yeah, it's, um, I I can almost, you know, one, one other model that might work for that, because I, I do want to recognize that you can have some really complex tools out there, right? Um, yes. And that you could have people that are more developer-like, but then maybe you bring in, sometimes people bring the sales team back in for that stuff or they bring in like a renewals expert i don't know if you've gotten to the stage where you just bring in like an adr for renewals or something like that yeah i've done that at other companies we don't do that at vendor we have csm's owning renewal transaction right now um but yeah i mean i've definitely seen it i think that it's interesting though that you say it somebody else commented on your post too saying well we don't expect sales to know the product and now they have sales engineers to do their demos for them which is interesting, right? Because then you talk about, okay, we're asking CSMs to own relationship, own implementation, own rollout, project manage the customer lifecycle, own renewal transaction, own upsell, be technical, make sure they're getting fierce, loyal customers that are going to provide case studies and references. Like, whoo. Wow. That is, that's, <laughs> that's an lot. amazing point. And I remember when that came through, the dimly lit light bulb went, went over my head and everything because I think you just summed it up all right there, right? That's an amazing point. Um, wow. I think that might be our answer right there. 
right? <laughs> We're asking CSMs to do too much. Yeah. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's what we're gonna. Again, it's very tough when you're trying to smooth this out and standardize across all. But I, I hate the it depends question and this and that. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to I'm gonna I'm going. I think so. My recommendation, you know, to to just get very much into the details here is if it's a very technical product, I do believe in having CSMs being able to understand the space, understand the outcomes that people are expecting. Yeah. Um, I had, we had a very interesting model at Virgin, which I bring this up because it is applicable for that solution, which is we had um, developers that were a couple years out of school um, and made, they weren't good enough to be on like the product development team. I was not good enough. Like they were just like a level behind that. They made mm -hmm. amazing. They said, you know, that's not for me or something like that. Those people understood everything that we're talking about and they would be um, now we call them CS associates, but this would this is before people started calling them CS engineers. Those people would be on all the account calls. So yep. if somebody started asking these in-depth questions, um, you know, because we had all these configuration bells and whistles that you could talk about and then write some code and do some stuff, that person would be able to speak to those, but they were they were mm -hmm. kind of like paired uh, as an account team. There were usually our larger accounts as well too. So I, mm -hmm. I, when I look at the model, we had big accounts and the CSM was paired with uh, a CS associate slash CS engineer. And, oh, what goals are you trying to get to? Oh, these are the outcomes that you want to do. Okay, let's look at your, let's look at the way your account's set up right now. Currently, you're not set up to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and then the CS associate would come in and be like, right, so we need to be able to do this, or can you provide this type of data over to this? And then it started getting yeah. like super technical. And, and that was not that technical. Of a pro there was some technicalities to it, but nothing mm -hmm. like we were talking about with like, oh, we're a headless API product or we're dev tools or X or Y. Yeah. Um, that's the only thing I've been able to, to come out to, especially when we're looking for all these perfect employees um these unicorns that are out there um they are super hard to find super hard to mm -hmm. find as you said you'll find one super expensive and then mm -hmm. suddenly if you just did the straight up math on this let's just do round numbers here imagine your your csms had uh, an ot of 120 right just as a normal thing that's not what you have to pay to get these this type of skill so you're probably playing 170 180 or something like mm -hmm. that versus paying people at the 120 and then bringing in these associates and it's, it's a scale, it's a more scalable model yeah. as well too. Um, you know, yeah. so you're not configuring and tweaking and doing all that stuff as well. So. Yeah. And we did like, uh, the overlay model with the more technical product at, at plural site, we did like, I, I believe it was one per team. Right. So say I had five CSM teams with five CSMs on each, it, there was, five of the technical overlay resource, one assigned to each team. So they weren't on every customer call, but mm -hmm. they were on the ones that, you know, mattered for it from a technical perspective. Um, and so I liked that model. They had more accounts in their portfolio, but they were really kind of like, if you think about the CSM quarterbacking the deal, right, they're just pulling in the right resources yeah. at the right time. Yeah. Um, and I think too, like you mentioned, they need to, you know, CSMs need to know the outcomes, what they're trying to drive. I also think it's like, it's incredibly important for them to understand the problems that that persona they're selling into faces, right? Yeah. It's like, you need to know the product, at like maybe a super user level, if it's not, like you said, a super technical product, but also you need to fiercely know your customer and fiercely know what they care about and what their problems are. So then you can prescribe the right solutions to them within the product. So, um, so on that note, playing in features, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, um, I think you can still hire really good CSMs. So, you know, those tools that I talked to, you're selling into develop, well, you're selling into like a CTO, but the people that you're working with are like development managers and things like that as well too. You can certainly, I think, get up to speed with what these people's issues and problems are. I want my team yes. to perform faster. I want them to work, you know, in a, well, in a faster and like more scalable thing. You know, you want as productivity numbers, what are you trying to get yep. at, you know, more with less and all these other things. Those are business conversations, right? And how to enable yes. them with your product. If it's if your te product's super technical in the background, I, I would just rather bring in somebody who can assist them with that instead of finding these unicorns out there to, to do that job. Yeah, totally agree.
All right. Are we just going to convince problem each other? Problem solved. Yeah. Pro <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm try I always try and come out with like one or two other alternatives so it doesn't sound like this is the way. But, you know, I guess the other one is to just hold out and wait and right, find the people or you bring a develop, you bring somebody in that skill set and bring them over. But then again, you're going to have to teach them these very hard soft skills. And then you might, again, yeah. again, everything that we talk about, you're bringing in another role to help out with a deficiency. Yes. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, you could build a farm team, right? You could start hiring CSMs from your support team, yeah, right? Because maybe they're that. more technical, more, and then you, you do like a whole path for them to be able to move into that role where they're training over time. Yeah. It's just a matter of investment, right? Yeah. Do you spend two years training someone to be ready for the role and they are that unicorn now? Or do you pay a premium to bring in someone now who could do it immediately? You do a little bit of both, I think. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, you know, if I was pressed, right, and, you know, I, and we had to ensure amazing greatness and everything, you know, I might hold out for the unicorn as a, as a patch solution. And then I really like bringing people up from support, bringing people up from implementation or the have the path be support implementation or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's a, that's a more scalable solution. 100%. So yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you bringing that one up as well too. All right. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, what are you doing for the rest of the summer? What's what's uh, what's uh, what's one fun thing that you're doing before school starts and everything? I don't know. You can do. Yeah, my daughter's gonna be in kindergarten yeah. in the fall. Yeah. Um, we're going to California in a couple weeks for a 10 year wedding anniversary. Oh, that's amazing! Really nice. With yeah, we're doing wine country. What? No, no kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a wine country. No, we can't bring a kid to Napa. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that sounds that sounds relaxing. And it's a little cooler up there. So uh I think so. I don't think they have the humidity that we have right now. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. It's uh I haven't really been outside today, but I think it's, it's about cool 87 and then you get the bright sun <laughs> and then you get about 95% humidity outside right now. Great. <laughs> just, just trying to sell it for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're doing a good job. <laughs> you are closer to the water than I am, though. So I am. Yeah, we have a good breeze. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, Lizzie, it's so great catching up with you. I'm gonna uh, grab your stuff to put it into the podcast links and everything. And cool. uh, it's just awesome to always chat with you. And uh, yeah, you hold too. On one, one minute here, and we'll uh, I'll hit stop for one second.